Thank you so much. Give Jesus an even bigger hand clap if you would. He's the reason we're here. Hallelujah. We're going to have a great day today. You may be seated. I'm going to get right into my message in just a little bit. I t showed the first service this. I'm going to show you because it's something we're proud of. Uh, if you're here again, then you heard me tell it a little bit, but it's hard for me not to use up all my time talking about it. God spoke to me in 2008. Uh, I had just preached in a little church in West Virginia. It had 21 people in the whole church and seated about 25. So I, I, I would write uh, in the newsletter that it was packed. But <laughs> they, um, I preached on revival, you know, like a good young evangelist and how we can see this country shaken. And then when I got back to my house that I had rented, uh, because the, they only had one motel in that town, and it just looked like a nice place to get murdered. It didn't look like a nice place to stay. So we rented a house, and uh, I got up there, and I felt the Lord, I heard, I heard it in my spirit. I heard him say, are you serious about what you preached? I said, yes. And he said, well, you know, you can't do that preaching to 21 people at a time if you want to see the country change. Well, like, it was as if I didn't feel bad enough. You know, it wasn't like I was turning down meetings of 1,000 people and choosing to preach to 21. It was the only invitation I had. But that was when the Lord shifted my thinking. He said, you think you need to get into bigger churches, but even if you were preaching to 500 or 1,000 or 2,000, there's 300 million people in this nation. And so if you're serious about doing what you said, and that's when he gave me the scripture that fueled our TV ministry that we started, uh, who takes a light and keeps it under a bushel, you put it up on a hill, where it, and it gives light to all. And uh, said, if you're serious about what you're doing, you need to go on television and not Christian TV. You need to go on secular TV channels, low numbers that everybody gets. And uh, I had $83 to my name. I don't mean we had a lot of money in the ministry and then I personally had $83. I'm talking combined assets. I was worth $83. And uh, I told the Lord, you know, I I'll do it. You know, you're, you're clearly going to have to make a way for it to happen. I could go through a lot of testimonies of how we got on the air. The whole thing has been miraculous. But we just finished wrapping season two of shooting and uh, Steph Stephanie Esposito is a reporter from Fox 29 in Houston that got baptized, or uh, Philadelphia that got baptized in the Holy Ghost in one of our meetings, so she's helping us out. But we're going to preach the gospel on Fox and ABC. We're already on, in, uh, the Lord told me to start in Pennsylvania. So we did Pittsburgh, Harrisburg, Scranton, and Altoona, Johnstown, which puts us on in 2.8 million homes uh, once a week. And then Philadelphia was the next one we had to knock out which, uh, you know, is more expensive. It's one of the biggest TV markets in the country. It'd be about equivalent with Dallas. 5.1 million homes, just that affiliate. You get all of Central Jersey, South Jersey, Atlantic City. And uh, I just think it's so great. We come on late at night, 1 a.m., 1.30, when troubled people are up with the Lunesta bu neon butterfly landing on them, trying to get them to go to sleep. They can't go to sleep. And uh, you don't have much competition at 1.30 in the morning. Hip-hop abs, the juicer. Brazilian butt lift, that's about it. <laughs> so it's easy, easy pickings. And uh, we've had testimonies pour in, but then Philly, as soon as we wrapped season two, we had an accounting firm call us and say that we feel like you should be on television in Philadelphia. Tell us how much it costs. So we told them, I'm not one of those like fake humble guys, but oh no, don't you. We told them exactly how much it costs <laughs> and they wired us the money uh, the next day to start. So it's all paid in advance. And we are, we're preaching, and then we demonstrate the power of God and show really great miracles. We have a kid, I told some of the miracles in the morning service, but there's another kid from outside of Chicago. If you looked at him straight on, I have the x-rays on our Instagram and, and Twitter and Facebook. His legs looked like a wishbone. He actually would walk on his ankles. His legs, I mean, not bowed. They, they were like, like a wish, I mean, just deformed. And uh, his mother brought him into one of the meetings, and his legs straightened out before I got a chance to pray for him. I had told the story how I had braces on my legs when I was a little kid. And when she heard that, she ran back and got her son to bring him for prayer. But just the act of faith of her getting her son out of the nursery and walking in, I said, whatever you brought your son in for prayer for, it's already done. I knew it in my spirit. And she looked at his legs and started crying. Then they brought him to the doctor. They had just done the measurements for the braces. And uh, they couldn't get the braces on the legs. So the doctor said, we just did these measurements a week ago. What happened? And she said, well, we brought him to one of those crazy faith healer uh, guys. And his legs straightened out. And the doctor, she said, got real somber and said, that's the only way you could explain what happened. This is a miracle. And so we have it documented. X-rays with the bowed legs, 
uh, x-rays with almost, then we came back this year, and he's totally straight. He ran around the church. So it's great to tell that in a church and have everybody clap, but most everybody already believes that stuff anyway. But the same way the devil's crowd believed in their filth enough to force it down your throat on television, I believe we can use it the exact reverse way and show people that had no plans of ever coming to church that Jesus is Lord, that he's alive, and he still answers those that call on his name. Can you say amen? Anyway, they're going to roll that. Enjoy it. you're joining us for another episode of Revival Today. I'm holding in my hand my cell phone and the camera roll, which is loaded with pictures of our last two years of meetings, people who came up at the end to tell us what God did in their life. What happened to telling the world about the red blood that Jesus spilled on Golgotha's hill that reaches to the highest mountain, that flows to the lowest valley, that gives strength to anybody that calls on that name? Can you say amen? If there was a sin that you've committed that God couldn't forgive, that would mean there was a power in sin that was greater than the power of the blood of Jesus. That's not possible. Everybody say this, my battles are only mine if I want them. But I can choose to cast all my cares on God and the Lord will fight my battles. Before you weren't saved, now you're saved. And I'm gonna ask God to cut the hand off of whatever hand the enemy was using to destroy your life. He won't be able to grip you anymore once we get done praying this. With your eyes closed and your hands lifted, permit me to bless you. Father, I thank you for my friends watching all around the world, whether it's drug addiction, sickness and disease in their body, depression, thoughts of suicide. for tonight a job a relationship a social status it's time to stop fighting welcome to revival today Jesus said give me your life and when you give me your life I will give you my life and as we preach it both here and with all those that are watching on television I pray you would do a mighty work by the power of the Holy Ghost and the message of the gospel is when he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the Bible says one day, Acts chapter 1, just as you saw him go, one day he will return. And he's returning for those that are ready. And I want you to be ready. Give Jesus one more hand clap for all he's done. I want you, if you have your Bible, to turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. One of the most powerful chapters in the entire Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, I'll begin reading at the first verse. Nice to be with you today in New Hampshire. They said it's Texas, but I've been to Texas before. It's not 38 degrees and foggy, so I don't care what they, where they say we are. We're in New England. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. This is the last thing the Apostle Peter wrote before he went to heaven. This is my second letter to you, dear friends, and in both of them I've tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. I want you to remember what the holy prophet said long ago. 
and what our Lord and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers or mockers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From before the times of our ancestors, everything has remained exactly the same since the world was first created. Five, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command, and he brought the earth out from the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will perish. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't being slow about his promise to return as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to perish. So he's giving more time for everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be exposed to judgment. I don't have time to go into it this morning, but that's one of many places where the Bible alludes to a coming nuclear war. The prophet in the Old Testament said, the armies that march against Israel, their eyes will melt out of their sockets, their tongue will melt out of their mouth, and the skin will melt off of their bodies. Then the Bible said here, the earth is not going to pass away again in a flood. That's what a rainbow is. God told Noah, never again will I destroy the earth with a flood. But the Bible says, I mean, you count it up four or five times, depending on the translation, just in this chapter. Peter said, there'll be intense, fervent heat that will melt the very elements away. I mean, you know, you read in Revelation, the Bible says there's gonna be one day, one act during a war where one third of the entire population of the earth is going to die. You know, it would be great, wouldn't it, for me to stand up right now and say, you know, let's just pray that everything goes back to 1980. Uh, It's a shame all that's going on in the world, but that's not the case. I've told this story before. I, I was stopping by my office. We, we got a new office this year, and uh, my phone call kept dropping to our administrator. So I stopped by the office. Uh, I was headed that way anyway, and I had to go to a meeting that night. So I didn't have much time. I was dressed like this. And the fire inspector came, uh, fire chief, to inspect our fire extinguishers because the government finds a way to get money from you any way they can. So uh, they checked to see if our extinguishers were up to code, and uh, sure enough, they weren't. And uh, so he told us how much we had to pay. Anyway, he goes, this is a nice office that you're in. I said, thank you. He said, what do you guys do here? Well, I figured rather than tell him, you know, people that aren't spiritual, I'm an evangelist, you know, they just say, oh, and they leave. So I, I figured rather than tell him, I'd show him. I said, do you hear everything that's going on with Russia and Russia encroaching on the Ukraine? Oh, yeah. And I said, you heard about Iran enriching uranium? and uh, for the, the, the sole purpose of making nuclear weapons to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. You know, they, they ran in primetime television on Iran a computer mock-up of them annihilating Israel, how they planned to do it. He said, yeah, I saw that, man. That stuff's a shame. I, I'm hoping it stops. I said, you can hope all you want. It's not going to stop. It's going to get worse. And so, he, you know, now, now he's locked in. He, he was just asking me a simple question, what we did for the office. Now I have, it, have, him, have him scared. So I said, uh, people should be scared. If you don't know the Lord, you need to be afraid. That's the problem with this country. People can go to church, most churches they can go to, Sunday after Sunday, uh, cheating on their wife, alcoholic, drunks, whatever, and the message they hear just gives them a, a positive reinforcement to continue down the wrong path. If America's going to be changed, people have to wake up and understand there really is a heaven, there really is a hell, and you're going to spend your eternity in one of those two places. And so uh, he, he said, well, well, you said it's not going to stop. What's going to happen? I, and I don't have time to go into it today. But I, if you read Ezekiel 38, in fact, I do have time. Take Ezekiel. Turn to Ezekiel 38, back where your pages are stuck together. <laughs> Ezekiel doesn't get out much. Ezekiel 38, verse 1. 
Ezekiel, the 38th chapter, the first verse. This is another message that came to me from the Lord. So Ezekiel's prophesying this. You know, this is what separates the Bible from every religious book. Buddha made no future predictions. Muhammad made no future predictions. It's how Isaiah mocked false religions. Isaiah said, okay, you know, you know God, let your God tell us the things that are going to happen. The devil doesn't know the future. The devil's a created being. He doesn't know anything that's going to happen after today. But God is the Alpha and the Omega. He knows the future better than we know the past. And he doesn't store it up. He doesn't do anything on the earth unless he first reveals it to his servants, the prophets. So he said, this message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, turn and face Gog in the land of Magog, which is Russia. These are all people groups. You know, who's Gog and Magog? If you study it, they were people groups alive at that time. So all you have to do is see where those people groups settled and what nations they became. Turn and face Russia. Any theology book you get, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, they're all going to tell you Gog and Magog's Russia. Turn and face Russia and the prince who rules over the nations of Meshach and Tubal and prophesy against him. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. Gog, I am your enemy. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws to lead you out with your whole army, your horses and charioteers in full armor and a great horde armed with shields and swords and all kinds of weapons. Persia, what's Persia? Iraq and Iran. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya will join you too with all their weapons. Gomer and all its armies will join you along with the armies of Beth to Garma from the north and many others. Now everybody knows Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Who in the world is Gomer and Beth to Garma? If you study it, I mean, it's on Wikipedia, not, not Bible prophecy, you study it anywhere. These were the people that settled on the Black Sea that now became modern day. I heard a prophecy, well, you had Dr. Lester Summerall preach here. He preached in the 90s that it was a, a region known as Crimea. Who ever heard of Crimea before the beginning of this year? Well, Bible prophecy, people were preaching it. God said, tell Russia. Before you go and attack Israel, I'm going to put a hook in your jaw that before you do, you'll gather these nations under yourself. Persia, Iraq, and who do you always see in bed together? Who's always supplying the weapons for Iraq and Iran? It's always comes Russia and China. China, the kings of the east, that will unite with Russia. They just signed a deal right now. I mean, you would have to be a fool not to just look at the rebirth of nations prophesied in the Bible and not know we are coming not to the last days. The last days started when the Holy Ghost fell in Acts 2. We are in the final hour of the last days. What does that mean? Jesus rose from from the dead. Everybody loves that. Praise God. But remember what it means that Jesus rose from the dead. Acts chapter 1. One day as he was blessing his disciples, he ascended into heaven. Two white robed men appeared and said, just as you saw him go, one day he will return. Jesus will come back to this earth again. And I've made up my mind. I'm going to be ready to meet him. How about you? We started two churches in, in Hawaii, and there was a, a, where we started the churches on the east side of Maui is where the headquarters for the Hawaiian sovereignty movement is located, where they're mad, you know, that the United States took their, their islands over and made them a state. Now people that had land for 150 years now have to pay taxes to a government that they don't never even ask to be there. So the original Hawaiians live back where we preach. And uh, they don't, you know, they don't like white people. They told me that going back there. They, they, they don't like white people back there. I said, that's, that's okay. There's a ton of them I don't like either. They, I, don't, I don't need them to like all white people, just me. Amen. And then introduce them to Jesus. So anyway, we went back there. And there was a guy, sure enough, what they said was true. This guy's almost 60 years old, original Hawaiian. And uh, we rented a house from him for our missions group that we brought back. He said, um, he said are you the preacher? Well, I used to always just say yes, but I've learned to say, and why do you ask? So I said, and why do you ask? He said, uh, I saw your picture on the poster. You're holding the meetings down there at the hall. I said, yeah. He said, uh, I'm mad at God. I said, well, that's foolish. You know, why would you get mad at God? Even if he's at fault, what court do you plan on taking him to? 
That don't make any sense. That's what the devil does. He tries to cut you off from the only one who can help you out, out of your problem. The devil, if he has his way, punches you in the face and tries to get you to think it's God doing it. But whatever is wrong in life was birthed by the devil. And if there's a miracle to get you out, it'll only come from the hand of God. So he, he said, I'm mad at God. I said, what, what are you mad at God for? Well, I don't understand why he allowed people to come over and take our island over. And so we've started this Hawaiian sovereignty movement. He sits on the board of it, and we're going to get our island back. He said, and uh, why won't God help us get our island back? I said, it has nothing to do with that. I said, let me tell you something. And I started telling him what I'm telling you now. Jesus is coming back. I, don't think, I think people have lost sight of this. This is why I have zero interest of going to meet with the Pope or trying to get in good with the Democrats or Republicans. I'm an ambassador from an invading army that's coming to take this place over, sending message ahead that you can join now or be destroyed. Why would I ever sell out to when there's another government that's going to get set up by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he shall reign forever and ever? So that's what I told him. I said, let me tell you something. You're wasting your time. Because even if you were successful in kicking the United States out of here, I explained, you know, and I, I can't go into everything I told him. I said, number one, you'd have to have a military strong enough to hold off North Korea, Japan, and China because you're in too key of a spot to, to, for somebody not to take over. Secondly, even if you could, I said, do you see everything that's going on in the Middle East? Just like I told the fire chief, Al. You see all that? I said, you know, Jesus is coming soon, and when he comes back, he's going to take over every nation that there is. I said, so why try to take it over when you're going to get kicked out anyway, when instead you could just join up with him now and then put in a request that when he comes back and you come back with him, may I please be in charge of Maui? <laughs> and he, he, he looked up and then he went like this. What time did you say you're preaching again? <laughs> and that's what I told Al. He said, how does all this end? I said, it ends with a war called Armageddon that's outlined very clearly in Ezekiel 38 where all the armies of the world will gather to make war against Israel. I mean, Armageddon's a term that's so ingrained in, in people's consciences. You know, there's a few things about the Bible it seems like almost anybody knows. Armageddon, rapture. They had, had a series this year on HBO that was about the rapture. They had two movies that came out in Hollywood about the rapture. People know all about it. And uh, the devil tries to mock it and skew it, but what does the Bible actually say about it? The Bible says that everything's going to culminate where it's headed right now. Gee, that's why I told the fire chief. He said, well, I'm going to hope it gets better. It's not going to get better. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, it's like a woman going into labor pains. Well, you know, when my wife had our little baby that's here, 20 months old. When she went to labor, March 3rd of last year, what kind of fool would I be to go, oh, you're, you're having contractions? Father, just help the contractions to stop. You know, no. When a pregnant woman goes into labor, not only are the contractions gonna keep coming, they're going to come more severe and with quicker rapidity up until the baby's born. Jesus said, when you see these things happening, this is where our world screwed up because they see all the signs that Jesus is coming and rather than let it wake them up that Christ is coming back, they're trying to stop it. We, we can fix climate change. Okay, have at it. You're not gonna do it. Jesus said in that day, Luke, the book of Luke, men will be perplexed because of the strange tides and roaring seas. So the earth itself, Romans 8, longing for the exposed to sin against its will. The trees didn't sin. Nothing on earth was meant to, to taste of sin. And when it came, the earth, as wickedness is abounding, is fighting against sin. Doesn't like it. Earthquakes, tidal waves. So what does our government do? What do they teach in school? Good Lord, there hasn't been a tidal wave in 50 years. Now there's been three in the last five years. There must be something off. Is Jesus, no, they don't say Jesus is coming soon. They say, let's raise more money so that we can stop tidal waves. Okay. <laughs> Real ingenious people. And so instead of it making them look up and wake their spirit up and say, man, th this stuff doesn't happen all the time. And it's happening now all the time. Wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said plagues. What do plagues mean? Incurable diseases. Ebola, enteria virus. What do they do? Instead of saying that, they say, good, good Lord, we're reaping a harvest from sin. We need to call on the Lord. No, they put up public service ads. We can beat AIDS. 
Oh, no, you can't. If you cured it, another disease will pop up behind it that's worse because the wages of sin is death. So rather than tell people to turn from your sin, they just try to find a way to cure the problem of sin. But you have to look at it like this. Sin is the root of the problem that brings branches. You can keep trying to cut the branches off the tree, but they'll keep growing back. What you must do instead is repent and allow the blood of Jesus to uproot that tree and hook you in to the tree of life whose name is Jesus Christ. It's the only hope for the nation. And so uh, that fire chief, when I told him this, because it says, what's going to happen right before Armageddon? First, I'll put a hook in the jaw of Russia to gather these nations to itself. Now, I don't, I'm only 34. Most people here would be older than me. In 92, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it looked like Russia was finished. And then when you would see China's role in Bible prophecy, that the Bible says they're going to be a major player, that seemed like such a joke in the 80s. I mean, I feel bad for my father, who used to preach this in the 80s. And tell about China being a world player. China. China was a joke in the United States. People would say all the time in America in the 80s, if it's made in China, I don't want it. Well, if you don't want something that's made in China now, you're not going to really have anything. <laughs> it was nothing but agrarian society farmland. And now the, the, all of the nations that Jesus outlines and the prophet outlines that when I come back, these will be the nations that are world players. They're all world players. Now you've got a man in charge of Russia. Vladimir Putin, who's fulfilling this, driven to take these nations, marches into Crimea. And I preached on it when it was happening. And when he said, no, I'm calling a truce, I'm not gonna go any further, I told everybody in Fitchburg, Massachusetts where I was preaching, that's a lie, he's gonna keep going. Now they announced this week, now you think what they're preaching in other churches right now, where we are one half step away from the whole thing coming to an end, three keys to a more organized life, you know, how to forgive people that have wronged you in the past. Do you need a, you just forgive them. You say, I forgive you, and it's over. It's, you don't need like a nine week series on it. You have the whole thing getting ready to hit the fan. And the people are oblivious. I don't know what happened in this country. People used, to, and, and see in Texas, it's different. If you were up where I am in the Northeast, if I wanted to go on TV down where you're at, I'd have to wait for another preacher to go off the air. You go to a city like Boston in the Northeast. Why is Boston such a liberal mess? New England, Vermont, 13% of people in Vermont go to church of any kind, Catholic or Protestant. Why? Totally unaggressive about Jesus said, you have one task till I come back. Warn men, tell them that I'm coming back and make sure they know that I'm not coming back for everyone, only those whose robes are white who walk with, what did we used to sing growing up in church? There's a highway to heaven. None can walk up there but the pure in heart. If you understand that Jesus is coming soon, it motivates you to live holy, to walk in forgiveness, to love your, because you're not going to let anything separate you from the holy God. You know, look, you're looking up, watching and waiting, for you know your redemption draws nigh. I thank God I'm saved. I thank God I'm healed. I thank God I'm blessed. But the end game is to get to heaven where Jesus said, I'm preparing something for you there. Paul said, I saw it, and what I saw up there, it's not lawful to tell men down here. We are going to a place called heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house, there is many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would tell you plainly. And so you keep yourself ready, knowing that just as Jesus rose from the dead, he's coming back again. You're going to meet him. The Bible says all those that pierced him will meet him. Every mocking Bill Maher, CNBC political host, that's every woman on The View, that if you say Jesus, they storm off set, they hate him. You know, you read it in the Bible. When Jesus appears, they're not going to say, oh, there's the Lord. The Bible says those that are wicked will gather their armies and say, we hated his follower. Now there's the king. Let's get him. And he'll destroy them. He's not coming back again as a baby in a manger. He's not coming back in a little Catholic portrait with a tear trickling down his cheek and a trickle of blood and a frown. The Bible says when he appears, 
he will destroy the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth and the splendor of his coming. John said he had a two-edged sword that proceeded from his mouth. His eyes were like flames of fire. His, bronze, his feet were like bronze refined in the furnace. His hair was white like wool. He had a white robe with a gold sash across his chest. He has a name written on him that only he knows what it means and a robe dipped in blood. And he said, when I saw him, I fell as one dead at his feet. But Jesus put his hand on me and picked me up and said, write unto the churches the things I tell you. Behold, I am the living one who died, but now I am alive and I live forevermore and I hold the keys. You know, you saw that, that little clip of me preaching in Penn State. One of the things I told them, I said, you know, because they, they say this on TV all the time. Well, you're welcome to your beliefs and you're welcome, as if we were like believing in like the Lucky Charms guy <laughs> being our savior. I said, you access Jesus by faith. But Christianity is not based on faith. It's based on a fact that Jesus died and rose from the dead. You can throw away every Bible on earth and in secular history, there's 10 times more evidence to justify the resurrection of Jesus than that Julius Caesar fought the wars that he fought. The tomb's empty. The Catholics say it's at one tomb. The Protestants say it's another tomb. And an archaeologist named Gordon thinks it's a third tomb. All three tombs are empty. Jesus is alive. He's in heaven, but he's coming back again. And you've got to be ready. I want you to be ready. I want you to throw off everything that would strip you from that life he has for you and receive him today if you know you're going to. I want you to take 20 seconds, clap those hands, and shout unto God with the voice of triumph, you're going to make it in Jesus' name. Let somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Ezekiel 38. Gomer and Beth to Garma. Crimea, the Ukraine, all those little nations that are on the Black Sea, before you attack Israel, you'll gather them under yourself. It's a military position. They need a seaport to go after Israel. And they're doing it right now. This is my dad had to preach this in the 80s and get people to, no, I'm telling you, Russia's gonna rise again. I have the easiest job in the world. I, I can show people that what Ezekiel said those thousands of years ago is transpiring right now. Then Russia announced this last, well, I guess, you know, Sunday's a new week. This last week that just finished, Russia is going to begin running uh, drills with their air force, the planes that carry the nuclear missiles, as close as the Gulf of Mexico. They're going to go you know, 12 miles off the coast, I think it starts international waters. They're going to fly within 12 miles of Houston, New Orleans, just like in the Cold War days. And now the polar ice caps, they can go over the top. That's why our military is running drills right now with Norway and uh, getting ready because they can come in through Canada. There's no mention of America in Bible prophecy. People used to think that was because America was going to be so strong that all the end time events were going to go on overseas and we were just going to play baseball and have Fourth of July cookouts while the Antichrist took over. <laughs> but you can see now that everything has played in. You've had the rebirth of the nations that God said would be strong and you have the dying of once, forget America, what about England? The sun used to never set on the British Empire. They owned from China all the way through to the United States now. And now they're so small and dying and having .9 children per British family while the Muslims are having 15 that they say in another 60 years there won't even be any British people left in England. They opposed Israel. They opposed God. And God lets those nations die. That's why America is worth fighting for. That's why we believe for revival. Because if they continue down a path, righteousness exalts a nation. But sin brings a curse on the people. It's almost over. 1988. With my speech impediment and crooked legs. They tried three different procedures on. I have an aunt here that could vouch for me. I went up to my room to change for bed. 
My mother had laid, third floor is 790 Wheatland Circle, Bridgeville, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh. My mother laid my pajamas out. I went to pick them up, and when I looked up, there was an angel on the other side of the bed. The angel said, Jonathan, God has reserved you for the last period of time to be an evangelist, to call men and women that are now in darkness into the light, for soon it will be eternally too late. Do you understand? And I said, yes. Eight sounds in the alphabet I couldn't say right. Five years of speech therapy, two days a week instead of going to recess. And the only time it got better was after that. The speech therapist called my mother and said, we've been working on him for five years. He had eight sounds he couldn't say right. He still has eight he can't say. So it'd probably be best for him just to play. And once somebody can't get any credit for it, that's usually when God comes in. He doesn't like splitting the glory with the speech therapist. <laughs> just got better. And then my legs straightened out. I can run fast. I had an old lady, I was preaching in Pittsburgh near where I grew up in January, and this old lady came up to me and said, you probably don't remember me, but I was your preschool teacher. Where are the braces that were on your legs? I said, back in hell with my speech impediment. <laughs> Return to sender. Amen. God called me to preach when he probably had six billion better options. How do you call somebody to preach that can't even speak? Now the biggest complaint I get is I talk too fast and people can't get up. That's when God said, I'll turn your weakness into strength. But he chooses things the world calls weak so that they never get raised up in pride and they can never glory in his presence. I know what I was before Jesus put his hand on my life. And everything I am now, it's because God gave it to me. I love Jesus. I'm going to meet him soon. People tell me about their Christian relatives that have died. I say, well, introduce me in a few days. We're going to come up and meet him soon. This earth's not my home. I'm not trying to save it. Polar bears are on their own. White tigers are on their own. Spotted owls are on their own. All the cats on the Sarah McLaughlin commercial can fend for themselves. I'm not trying to hold on to this planet. This earth is not my home. When I received Jesus, I died to this earth. And its interest in me died as well. But I am very much alive unto God. And I'm looking forward. I didn't finish 2 Peter 3. Peter said, we are looking forward. Everybody say, looking forward. looking forward. It's hard not to backslide when you're not looking forward. If you're thinking of your friends that you have to leave, your old girlfriend that you had to leave, where am I going to live now? I live with my boyfriend. If I get saved, I can't live there anymore. You'll end up going back. How did Joseph never backslide? with all the garbage that happened to him, his own family selling him into slavery. And then when he finally is getting ahead, a lady throwing herself at him and saying, please have sex with me. He says, How can I do such a wicked thing against God? And what's his reward for that? Getting convicted of attempted rape and thrown in jail. And how come he never got bitter or upset? Because he knew in a dream where things were going to end up. So no matter what happened around him, he knew I'm headed forward. And no matter what the devil wants to throw my way or my family or people, I will never let it affect me in my spirit because I know I'm headed for the top. My brother and sister, let a realization come into you today that no matter what happens, this earth is not my home. I have reservations to meet my Lord in heaven and I'm not selling them out for anything or anyone. If that sounds like you, can you shout amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's almost over. They'll gather unto themselves, Gomer and Beth to Garma, like they're doing right now. How does a country just go into Ukraine and take it? And then now they said they're setting up reconnaissance off the coast of Alaska to move in there, because Russia's right by Alaska. I preached in Alaska a couple weeks ago, and one of the pastors in the village right by Russia said they saw Russian men in a boat come on shore. You know, when you're in a village with 300 people of native Alaskans, you notice when there's new people there. And the pastor said he got a call from a colonel and said, uh, have you seen anyone new in the village recently that looks Russian? He said, uh, yes, I have. He said, well, I'm going to call you periodically. They said you would be a good point man there. I know you're a pastor and somebody we can trust. He said, keep an eye out and I'll call you. I wasn't going to tell anybody that, but now they announced, Russia's openly announcing they're putting reconnaissance bases 400 miles from Alaska. To move. Let me tell you, 
These bunch of people that live in this country, they are not ready for what's coming. When Iran announced they were getting ready to make nuclear weapons to open up on Israel, I watched the news that night, which I normally never do, and I was thinking, now, you know, they're gonna, this is gonna wake people up. The first 53 minutes of the newscast that Sunday night, after Netanyahu pleaded with the UN to not let him do it, was what the Pittsburgh Steelers have to do to make the playoffs this year. People are going to football. That's all anybody cares about today. I don't know if the Cowboys have a bye. That's all people care. NFL. What movies are coming out? What drinks are out at Starbucks? Completely oblivious to what's getting ready to come. But I'm not one of them. I refuse to be a dumb 34-year-old that reads about Kim Kardashian and Kanye West marriage and whether it's breaking up and who's ashamed of their beach body comes swimsuit. See, look at what's on the magazines. People are blind following other people's lives that they don't even know. When you have an immortal soul on the inside of you that once you're born, you forever will be. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, 36 and 37, what does it profit a man if he gains this whole world but forfeit, loses his soul in the process? Is there anything more valuable than a man's soul? Hebrews 9:27. It is appointed unto every man once to die. And after that, the judgment. Once you're born, you forever will be. Jesus said, broad is the way. In the first New Living Translation that came out in 1996, it said, uh, the highway that leads to hell is broad for the many that choose the easy way. But the path that leads to heaven is straight and narrow, and only a few ever find it. You don't have to, see, and I'll tell you, this really irritates me. How I've never seen, like in the last seven years maybe, where no one talks about hell at all. You know, a preacher will die, and you'll have other preachers put on the Facebook post, rest in peace, brother, rest in peace. Rest in peace is what pagans say. When I die, my body does not lay in that. My body is in that casket. But there's a real you on the inside, a spirit man, that the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then it says in Luke 16, when the rich man who never made things right with God died, he went to the place of hell. And there in torment, the worst, this is what religious preachers say that I grew up around. The worst thing about being in hell, you can always tell they're dead and don't pray. They all talk the same. White, black, Puerto Rican, they all that same dead voice. The worst thing about being in hell will be you'll be separated from God for eternity. Is that the worst thing that's going to be about hell? What would someone care that's been separated from God their whole life that they're still separated from him? When the rich man went to hell, the first thing he said was, Father Abraham, please have pity on me. Dip your finger in some water and cool my tongue because I'm in anguish in these flames. If you understand hell, Dr. Lester Summerall, you read his vision he had. A, well, you see that one time, and it's not a game anymore. You realize when you stand like where I'm standing, everybody I'm looking at, I'm at uh, there's some of you I'll never see again. This is it. You'll make a decision right now to either get your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life or to reject God, and you'll go to hell. Where there's, I want to go to hell. That's where I'm my friend, okay. Where there's outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. In the first million years you've been there, you haven't been there 1% of the time. It's a horrible, it was a, it's a place so vile. Number one, God never meant for anybody to go there. If you go, you send yourself by listening to somebody like me and say, oh, go on with yourself. I got a life to live. I don't got time for that nonsense. And you reject the invitation of God and march off on the path that's heavily traveled to hell. Did that open air crusade in Penn State, man. It cost 26 grand to do one night. I'm gonna get a lot of money and do one for like 30 days. These universities are hell holes. Go to one on a Friday night or Saturday night. Just go to the town that it's in and just watch people falling over drunk. Three people making out with each. Just a, Who's going to tell them that Jesus is coming soon? Jesus said, before I come back, wickedness will be pervasive, be everywhere. 
and it'll cause, even the people that aren't engaging in it, it'll cause the love of many to grow cold because sin will be all around them and it'll make them, uh, you know, I think I'm doing all right. You don't get judged by the standard of Dallas, Texas, Fort Worth, Arlington. You don't get judged on an American scale. The Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see God. Noah was a righteous man and the only one in the entire world. And God didn't say, well, that would be crazy to save one person. Let me just make, no. Moses, Noah told him the whole time he built the boat and they all chose not to do it. So everybody, God did not lower his standard. His wickedness got worse. I know it's a different world. I know it seems like everybody sleeps. You know, if you've dated somebody three times and haven't had sex, there's something wrong with you. Some of you'd have your own father tease you in your house. What are you, gay? You haven't slept with that girl yet? That's how this world thinks. But you've got to divorce yourself from how this world thinks and say, if Jesus has a standard and he died for me I, and he has a place for me and he's coming back again, then I am going to be ready. If everybody goes with me, great. But if everybody turns against me, makes no difference. I have decided to follow Jesus and I shall not turn back. When I finished telling Al about Armageddon, and I told him about how Russia's gathering those nations, and then he's going to attack Israel out of the north. He said, well, then what happens? I said, that's Armageddon. I told him what the war was, that the blood will flow to the horse's bridle. All these weapons that have been developed, they haven't been developed to not be used. It's all going to be a big showdown. And he said, and I quote, oh, shoot. He said, well, you said somebody that's rejected God has to go through that. That's right. And he said, you people that have received Jesus get to escape. Correct. He said, what about somebody that hasn't made up their mind one way or the other? Talking about himself. I said, default is hell. Because Jesus said in Revelation 3, I would that you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And that's when he said, oh, shoot. I said, but you asked me what I do for a living. I said, I make sure you don't go out to your car saying, oh, shoot, I'm, I'm a goner. I said, if you want to receive Jesus Christ right now, no matter who, what you've done, I said, he'll forgive you, and you can have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Would you like that, Al? Very much. And you know that's an anointing. What would make a 55-year-old man who's doing well in life care, care what I have to say? Unless the Holy Ghost gets a hold of his heart. Same way that Penn State, they're all mocking in the beginning, then you preach the word, because you have a spirit on the inside of you. The Bible says the law of God's known to your heart. So it wakes you. You've got to wake up. Right now, you've got to wake up and let the Holy Ghost illuminate to you everything that you've allowed into your life that is a demonic trapping to pull your love for God away and to get you on a path that leads to hell. Backsliding is not a blowout. Backsliding is a slow, steady leak where you start making compromises here and you know, do you really have to not drink to get drunk? I mean, I don't get drunk. I just, yeah. And then down you go. Down the road, justifying sin. You're why I'm here. I told you that. That's why I'm here by the call of an angel that was sent from God to call people out before it's too late. I don't want, you, I don't want those Penn State students to go to hell. I don't want that fire chief to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. Hell's a horrible place that God felt so strongly about that he sent the only son. Anybody has a kid, if you can't understand. Now, now I really get it. To have one kid and send them, not to die, to get tortured and die so that everybody else can be saved. That's a God of love. And that's why there's still only one way to heaven whereby ye must be saved. It's not through Buddha. Buddha didn't die for anybody. Buddha didn't have holy blood to redeem anybody with. Muhammad commanded that his followers die for him. Jesus said, I have come to die for you and open up a way to heaven so that no matter who you are, what you've done, if you call on my name, you'll be saved. Are you saved? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that if the trumpet was going to sound right now and the dead in Christ were to rise, that's why the Christians didn't used to cremate people. Everybody just save money, get their loved ones cremated. You know why Christians bury somebody in their Sunday suit holding their Bible? 
Because one day, the bodies of the dead in Christ will rise. And we that are alive and remain in the twinkling of an eye will be caught up together to meet them with the Lord. God is keeping record in heaven. God sees all your trials. God sees all your temptation. And you have to understand that your trials, the end game, is not to get you sad. It is to discourage you and say, what's the use of serving God? That's what the devil tries to do. It's what he did to Job. It's what he does to everybody. What did Satan say to God? Oh, I know Job serves you. Watch when I get done with him. He'll curse you and die. He thinks he can get anybody from preachers on down the line. You let me have one year with him. I'll get him to say, what's the use? There's a lot of people like that. No, I tried serving God. Where did it ever get me? That's what Job's own wife said to him. You're going to still serve God? Look at everything that happened. Curse him and die. He said, you talk like a foolish woman. God's welcome to kill me right now, and I'll still trust him. And that's why Job is in this book as a record of somebody who faced every kind of adversity but said, no, God is my God till the death, and I shall not turn back. I want everybody to stand to your feet, and as you do, bow your head and close your eyes. Let me read you one more thing before I call you forward. Right after Jesus gave his end time dissertation, Matthew 25, 1 to 13, you can look up at me. Jesus said, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish, five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So as Jesus waited his coming, there was a tendency for everyone to get lazy. At midnight, they were roused by a shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridegrooms got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't even know who you are. So you too must keep watch. For you do not know the day or the hour when the Son of Man returns. I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up around preacher's kids. You think they're all like Austin and me? There's ones that are probably just waking up right now at 12 whatever from whatever they did last night. They're going to go split hell open to get revenge on their dad in the church because people hurt me there. Nothing is worth your soul. I don't care who says what about me. I'm going to heaven. I'll blow them a kiss and forgive them. I'm not going to get jaded and have some story that justifies why I'm not living on fire for God anymore. Jesus said in this story that while he waited his coming, there were 10 that were originally ready and five out of the original 10 let their fire go out. And while they were busy trying to get their lives back together, it was too late and they knocked on the door and Jesus said, Lord, we know you. I believe in you. It's not enough to believe in God. You believe there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe and tremble, but demons will not be in heaven. You have to do more than believe in Jesus. You have to receive him into your heart. Allow him to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire because in this hour of time, you are not going to be able to live a holy life by willpower or because your mother expects it of you or because you were raised better. There has to be, with all this force in the world to try to pull you off, there has to be something that burns on the inside of you that you say, not me. I know I'm meant for more than that. Uh, there's a Holy Spirit in me that bears witness for the better things that are to come. I'm not selling my life out. I'm going to have what Jesus died so that I can have. Every head bowed eye and every eye closed.
and everybody that's watching on TV, I want you to respond to this call in your bedroom, living room, hotel room. If they were too lazy to change the channel at the bar, and I'm on, you need to get saved. Time is almost up. People have been preaching that for 100 years now. And so exactly what Peter said would happen has happened. Jesus promised to come back, did he? Then where is he? Oh, he's coming. He's waiting so that people have time to be saved. It's the only reason he hasn't come back yet. He knows there's people in this room that if he would have come back by now, you'd be gone. But he gave time so you could hear this skinny Polish guy from Pennsylvania tell you to wake up and get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you and make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And do it today. He's about ready to come back. If you say, Jonathan, think of this. It's the most important question anybody will ever ask you. Has there ever been a time in your life where you publicly made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? He said it has to be public. Luke 12, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. Have you ever done it? If not, do it today. It'd be my honor to pray for you before I leave Texas. There's others of you here that you once did that and meant it with all your heart, but you let the fire go out. You're not living on fire for God. You yelled in your house today. Anybody seen my Bible? Because the last place it was was wherever you put it last Sunday. You don't read your Bible anymore. You don't pray anymore. Things are dying out. But in a meeting like this, you're one prayer away. You're saying, Father, relight the fire. I don't want my fire to grow dim. I want to be on fire. My lamp burning bright when you come back. And so today, everything the enemy's using to try to extinguish my flame, I lay it at the altar. Fill me anew and afresh with the mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you're here today and you fall into either of those two categories, and you say, man, I, I need to give my life to the Lord, and I mean it today. I'm not turning back. I, I've seen what this world has for me. I don't want it. I know what God has for me, and I want what God has for me. I'm going to be ready when he comes back. Teenagers, university and college students, mothers and fathers, whoever you are, if you know you need to make things right with God today, I want you to put your hand up high right now in Jesus' name. Keep it up high. God bless you. Very quickly, everybody lifted a hand and meant business with God. I want you to come to the altar right now in Jesus' name. Come now. If you're in the middle, tap the people next to you. Don't let some silly reason keep you from making today the day that you give everything to the Lord God. Keep coming. Come quickly in Jesus' name. Come. Come. Fill in all around the altar in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Mindia, let him touch you right there. Look how Jesus is waiting for you right now to get a hold of your heart. You'll never be the same. He's going to give you power. There's a lot of you here. He's going to give you power to be the first in your family to truly come out of sin and live a righteous life. In Jesus' name. Anybody else before we pray? I'll wait 10 more seconds. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Lift your hands all across this altar. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we pray together, I pray that they would feel down on the inside of them, your Holy Spirit come in and take away everything that's not of you. Every addiction, every unclean thought, every chain of immorality that so easily pulled them off the path of life. I curse, let it be broken now, now in Jesus' name. And in that same mighty name of Jesus, as we pray, flood them with your presence. Give them more than they can hold in the name of Jesus Christ. With those hands lifted, I want you to say this prayer with me. This is not a recital. Pray this from the depth of your heart and let Jesus come in, never to be the same. Say this out loud, dear Heavenly Father, I've come forward today to give you my life. 
I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Have mercy on me. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Make me new. I believe in my heart. You raised Jesus from the dead. I confess with my mouth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my King. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Fill me with your power. Where I was weak, make me strong. In Jesus' name, I am saved. I am a Christian. God is my Father. Heaven is my home. And I will not turn back. In Jesus' name. Now with your hands lifted, I curse alcohol addiction. I curse prescription pill addiction. I curse heroin and methamphetamine addiction. I curse the spirit of sexual immorality that pulls you to clubs and bars into unclean relationships in the name of Jesus Christ. Be free in Jesus' name. I command the enemy's hold on your life to be broken forever. And the next time he comes back to tempt you or give you try, let there be a fire on the inside of you that consumes every attack of the wicked one in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for it, Lord. I want these two ladies right here, you and you in the pink, come right up here. In Jesus' name, power of God's all over you. And as I lay hands on them, let the power of God touch everybody here. Stand and face me, lift both hands. As you do, the power of God comes upon you. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you for it. Lift your hands all over this auditorium. Father, every person that's here, every unsaved son, every unsaved daughter, everything that's askew in their family, you said that salvation will come to them and their house. Let a mighty work begin now that quickly brings everything that's broken back to restoration in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, I curse the taste for alcohol off your tongue and lips. In the name of Jesus, it won't lead you back anymore to a life that you don't want to live. I curse legal problems from your past life. Let them fall off. This young lady here in the orange shirt, have her come up. Come right here. That's the power of God. Lift your hands. I'm going to tell you, after you leave this service, delete the digital music you have, whether you store it on your phone or whatever, and you'll never go back into that problem again. I curse depression, I curse fear and anxiety, and instead I replace it with the mighty Holy Ghost. Here it is. Be filled more in the name of Jesus. All the students that are here, depression, anxiety, all those na eating disorders, everything the enemy's tried to put on you, it falls off now in the name of Jesus Christ. You're not like everybody else. You're not going to live like everybody else. You are set apart for the work of God in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, everybody said, I want Pastor Austin to come join me on the platform. I want everybody to stay right here. I welcome you to the family of God. I love you. The best is still to come. Can you say amen? amen. You're never going to be the same. It's been an honor preaching to you. Stay plugged into this church. This church is a special church with a pastor that preaches what should be being preached now. And so stay here. Don't let some little offense rub you out and go to some place where they, you know, everybody just sits with a coffee for 20 minutes and does nothing. Stay plugged in here and let what God started today grow. He that began a good work in you will bring it to completion in Jesus' name. Give the Lord one more mighty hand clap. Pastor Austin.